And then I've got to get rid of all his stockholders' equity accounts because that's what my stockholders have now. They're going to get the point stock and that's going to liquidate their ownership in Sharp. So I'm going to take off common stock, which their common stock of Sharp is $5 par. This is not points common stock. This is <coughs> Sharp's common stock that, that the shop, Sharp stockholders own. So we got here additional paid in capital. Um, I might as well put the amounts in. The common stock is 100000 Additional paid in capital is 50000 And also this retains earnings. It should be noted that we didn't close the gain account to retain earnings. And if you did that, then you, would, you could have that intermediate journal entry in between. And you look at this carefully to make sure that everything balances, everything does. And if you do the T accounts, you'll see that we have completely brought every account in Sharps books down to zero, which is exactly what we wanted to do here. And that's it. So all of the assets have been moved over to points books at fair market value. And everything on Sharps books has been liquidated. The remaining stock in point that was on Sharp's books has been given to the stockholders and Sharp no longer exists. Let's go back to Goodwill Impairment again. We said that under the new accounting, which really is like 20 years old, but under the new accounting, Goodwill does not need to be amortized, but it must be tested for impairment. And let's talk a little bit about how it's tested for impairment. First of all, a goodwill impairment loss would be recognized as part of income from continuing operations. It could be recognized as part of a gain or loss from discontinued operations if it's associated with the segment of the business that's being discontinued. You must test goodwill at least once a year at the same time every year. And you must also test it if some, if an event occurs that might lead you to believe that it's impaired. One of those events would be transferring assets over to, um, to a subsidiary would be one event. Um, a decline in sales would be another event. And goodwill is always assigned to a specific reporting unit, what's called a reporting unit. And what you would do is you would look at the fair value of the reporting unit and compare it to its compare carrying value. And, the impairment would be the difference between the carrying value of the reporting unit and the fair value. So to the extent that the carrying value exceeds the fair value, that would be the amount of the impairment. Let's go through an example. Let's look at some examples. Let's suppose that reporting unit A has $100,000 worth of goodwill. So everything their carrying value consists of cash and receivables, 50,000, inventory, 80,000, Equipment 120,000 and goodwill of 100,000 and they have payables of 10,000. So total carrying amount of this reporting unit is $340,000. Now you may ask, what is a reporting unit? It's a good question. What is a reporting unit? A reporting unit is anything you want it to be. You can set what the reporting unit is. It should be reasonably what the goodwill is associated with. In other words, what you bought. So when you bought the company, you determined that the goodwill is associated with a certain piece of the company, and therefore that piece of the company is gonna be the reporting unit. You um, can combine reporting units in some cases, but you have to be extremely careful. If you eliminate a reporting unit, then you really don't have a justification to have the goodwill anymore. Now, the way you would account for this within your books is you would have to segregate these assets from other assets. You would need to record them in separate accounts on your general ledger. So let's suppose the fair value of the reporting unit is 360. Carrying amount is 340 and therefore you don't have any problem. But let's say the carrying value, the fair value is 280. Then the carrying amount of the net assets would be 340 and therefore you would have an impairment loss of $60,000. And that would be an impairment of goodwill, your goodwill would then be $40,000 lower. Now, this is not to say that you may not, you might also have an impairment of your equipment and you need to look at that. You might want to do that impairment first because this would be a triggering event to indicate the equipment might also be impaired. 
you might want to look at the equipment first um, to see if that was impaired, write it down, and then do this test. And that might lead to a larger, smaller impairment of goodwill. This is my favorite, very favorite. Suppose Point paid $500,000 to acquire Sharp. And this is something called a bargain purchase. And it would be a situation where you have negative goodwill. So we have the same setup as before, but they're only paying $500,000. So let's fill out this little thing here. Consideration would be 500,000. The fair market value of the net identifiable assets is 510. And the book value is 100 plus 50 plus 150 or 300. So your write-ups and your write-downs would again be just like it was before, $210,000, but your goodwill is negative. So that creates, that's negative goodwill. And there's, that creates a real question about what you're supposed to do with negative goodwill. Because positive goodwill is going to be an asset. Is negative goodwill going to be a liability? And think about what's going on here. You're buying a company with identifiable assets worth $510,000 and you're only paying $500,000. Why are you getting such a good deal? And it may just be that they're eager to do it. It may be that they're hidden liabilities. If they're hidden liabilities, then you better go back and fix this because then you're missing some liabilities. So when you have negative goodwill, you better make sure that your fair values are accurate because if they're not accurate, then you, don't really, you shouldn't really be having negative goodwill. And the chance that anyone is giving you anything for free, well, you know the likelihood of that. So let's put all the assets on our books and we'll get to this in a moment. We have cash and receivables, inventory, plan, buildings and equipment, and patent. And we're giving up cash of $500,000. Cash and receivables is, um, everything's going on at fair market value because that's what I'm getting, right? I've also, I'm taking, I'm accepting these current liabilities. So now these are going to be my current liabilities. 110,000. And I got this negative goodwill. If you add up the debits and credits here, they don't equal because I'm not recording the goodwill. So I got to do something with this goodwill. And it's going to be a credit. I know that. So what do you do with this? Is it a liability? It's not a liability. It's a gain on bargain purchase of Sharp company. And you can actually put it on your income statement. And what's so weird about this gain is this usually you record gains when you sell things. And in this case, you're buying something. So FASB allows you to do this. It's 100% it's legitimate. But you got to be very careful that your assets have been properly valued and that you've recorded, any, you've recorded all your possible liabilities. It could be that there's a big lawsuit out there. That's how you got the company so cheap. So, or a potential lawsuit. And if there's a potential lawsuit, that's contingent consideration and that needs to be recorded. So the chance that you would have a bargain purchase are pretty slim. Um, Professor Henry and I did some research like 10 years ago and we looked up bargain purchases. And we saw that in one in a period of like three or four years, I think we had we found like five or six bargain purchases. So in among public companies, so bargain purchases do happen, but they're very very rare. Now the FASB said that a bargain purchase is extraordinary, is an extraordinary gain. But since then, the FASB has done away with that, and a bargain purchase is not extraordinary. Now let's talk briefly about intangibles. We said that when you estimate the fair value of everything that you're buying, the fair market value of the net, net identifiable assets, MFV, FMV, NIA, um, the ASC 805, that's Accounting Standards Codification 805 says, 
that <clears throat> you an intangible asset can be recognized separately if only if you can recognize its benefits separately which is should be doable if they have a finite life they should be amortized over their useful life so for example if you're if you're um, capitalizing a patent and the patent has a fixed life, then you capital you amortize it over its reasonable life. Um, if an intangible asset has an indefinite life or an infinite life like goodwill, then you don't have to amortize them, but you do need to test them for impairment. So intangible assets are recognized under ASC 805. They recognize it fair value. Um, there needs to be a legal or contractual right to them. Um, or um, they're separable in some way. So if you, let's say the company did some R&D and this is valuable R&D. It might not have yet be patented, but it has some value as technology to you. If it's separable, in other words, you can identify what it is then you can assign that as an intangible asset. For example, a customer list, a proprietary customer list, or this is very big today, data. If you are buying the data with the company, a certain amount of data, and that data has value and you can identify, you can separate it from the value of other things, which you should be able to do, then that can be capitalized. So these are some of the things that can be recognized separately marketing related intangibles like trademarks internet domains customer related intangibles like customer lists backlogs um in other words backlog means that customers have ordered some things from the company that you they expect to buy um artistic related like copyrights a book rights to a book for example contract based intangibles like licenses franchises broadcast rights technology based intangibles and um, as I said, the um, data, data is valuable. Now let's do a standard stock acquisition where the parent acquires the stock of Sharp and leaves Sharp alone to operate as a separate company. So same scenario as before, with all the same goodwill and everything. I'm gonna I'm gonna set that aside for this particular problem. Um, you know the detail about the goodwill and things because that's not relevant here. It's it, it, it's the same as before basically. Sharp issues ten thousand shares, ten dollar par value stock, market value six hundred ten thousand dollars. Everything else is the same. Merger cost of forty thousand, stock issuance cost is twenty five thousand. I'm going to record this as a single merger cost is going to be acquisition expense. Um, stock issuance cost is deferred stock issuance costs of $25,000. And that'll be, you remember that's going to be offset against additional paid in capital cash is $65,000. The way that point would record this on its books, all right, let's do the stock first. Common stock at $10 par would be 10,000 times $10 or $100,000. Then there's gonna be additional paid in capital. We gotta see how much that would be for. And there's also gonna be deferred stock issuance costs. for $25,000. Got to take that off the books. The only thing that's going to go on to points books is investment in sharp company common stock for 610. That's the only asset that's going to appear on the books, just an investment account. That's it because they're leaving sharp alone. In the previous ones, they took all of sharp's assets and they put it right onto points books. They put the liabilities, they put it onto points books. Here, you're leaving Sharp alone and you just own the stock. So if you just own the stock, then the only thing that needs to go on your asset, on your balance sheet, is going to be <clears throat> one line item, investment in Sharp. That's it. Just like so. And Sharp is going to be left alone. So nothing gets recorded on Sharp's books. Now, 
there's an important note to make here when you're issuing stock and that's that if you issue stock it does affect stockholder value so let's just go through this example it's sort of a digression in the book but it's worth looking at this point corporation here right and before anything happened there was separate income excluding sharp for point of this is just all hypothetical of 300,000 in 2020 and they had shares outstanding at the time of $30,000 and points net income what well, I'm sorry points so points net income was $300,000 and points earnings per share was 300,000 divided by 30,000 shares or $10 a share. And then point bought, bought Sharp. So now what Sharp brings to the table is let's just say Sharp has income on its own of $60,000 a year. Now point issued shares for, for Sharp. So point had 30,000 plus the 10,000 shares that it issued. So now Point has 40,000 shares outstanding. Point's total net income after the acquisition would be 300,000 plus the $60,000 that it earned from Sharp, or 360,000. And Point's earnings per share would be 360,000 divided by 40,000 shares, or $9 a share. So what you see here is pretty weird because Point's earnings per share is actually going down as a result of the acquisition. And this goes back to the point that I was saying, point, get it, point? This goes back to the point that I said at the very beginning of this of these videos for chapter one. Bigger is not necessarily better. What you did here was you issued so much stock, point issued so much stock to buy Sharp that it diluted the value of its shares. So now it has more shares outstanding and it might have more income, but the number of shares outstanding was so increased by so much that it decreased the earnings per share. And of course, that is not a good thing. Let's try some questions before we move on. A form of consideration not allowed in acquisition accounting is, which is not allowed. You can't buy another company with this. Cash, bonds, preferred stock, common stock. None of the above. Answer is, none of the above. Which of the following costs can be added to the cost of an acquisition? So we said that, how do you determine the consideration when you make an acquisition? Um, the company's gonna pay cash. They might issue, they might give stock, right? So here's some other things to think about. Legal fees can be added, accounting fees, cost of issuing common stock, prorate a portion of the CEO's salary because the CEO worked hard on this acquisition, travel costs, cost of the M&A department, or none of the above. Answer is none of the above. All of the costs of the acquisition, besides the direct cost of acquiring the company itself, are not capitalized. They're going to be expensed.